All right, welcome to Judiciary. We're going to be considering two bills today. First Senate or Senate files, excuse me. First Senate file 39, digital identity. A little bit of a new topic for the Judiciary Committee, but I'm confident they can handle it. And Senate file 19, public health emergencies, immunity amendments. A little more in our wheelhouse. We're going to start with Senate file 39. Digital identity. This is a product of the Select Committee on Blockchain, Financial Technology, and Digital Innovations. I have with us my co-chair from the Senate, Senator Rothfuss, and we are joined by former Representative Tyler Lindholm, who was on this Select Committee. I believe um, the two of you are going to present this bill. Is that is that what we're going to do? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd Senator be happy Rothfuss. to start. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I do have another meeting coming right up, so I will start and then I'll hand over to former Representative Lynn Tome. Uh, we also have online, I believe, Mr. Daza Greenwood, who was part of the working group that worked through the Blockchain Select Committee to prepare this legislation. Uh, so Clarissa, do you have Mr. Greenwood in the waiting room? Mr. Chairman, I do, and he has been admitted to the meeting. All Perfect. right, you can turn on your camera, Mr. Greenwood. And then um, we'll just let the three of you present together and and uh, see where it takes us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Senate File 39, Digital Identity, uh, it's a short bill uh, and relatively straightforward. We'll go through what it currently does. A tremendous amount of time actually went into getting it to this point, and it serves as a foundation for what we hope to be a substantial amount of additional work. Uh, the concept here with a digital identity is the idea of trying to formulate your digital presence in a way that we can then assign rights to it. Uh, a lot of what this does, you could probably think, well, we could probably already do that under statute. And that is probably true, but it's not clear in statute and it's not unambiguous. So the work of the Blockchain Select Committee recognizes that a digital identity and a representation of yourself through online operations, internet, blockchain transactions, uh, banking, we already do these kinds of things, but it's a little bit ad hoc. And we wanted to flesh it out and provide clarity because these types of transactions are going to be more and more powerful and more and more important moving forward. Other states and other countries have also grappled with concepts of privacy rights, but they've done those on largely an ad hoc basis. So GDPR, uh, which governs privacy rights in Europe and the CCPA and later amendments uh, are an advanced privacy rights construct on a West Coast state. And we're taking a little bit of a different approach because of the work that we've done in the past with the blockchain uh, technology and digital asset custodianship, where we want to build up from the idea of a digital identity, empower that, and then ideally in the future, hopefully next year, come back and look at privacy rights and property rights as they relate and interact with your digital identity. A different approach to how other states and countries have done it, but hopefully one that is a, a more substantial approach to build off of. And again, we spent a tremendous number of hours with a lot of great legal minds coming together uh, to work on this draft and really just get to the de definition phase. So that's what we're going to see today is a definition and a minor empowerment of that definition. Walking through the legislation on to page two. Senator, just go ahead to drive. I think to drive that home. Um, this this bill is simply a definition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, it, it's two definitions or two definitions, yes. references to those two definitions, and then a link to the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act effectively as a, a baseline empowerment of those definitions, as we'll see. Go ahead. All right. I'm actually going to strangely start, if you will, on page three, the bottom of page three. And this is just based on legislative construct that that's where the beginning ends up being which gets to the actual definitions, which are put into statute in Title VIII, which are general definitions that apply throughout the statute. And you see as used in these 
statutes unless the legislature clearly specifies otherwise. Two new definitions, which are on page four. Personal digital identity means the intangible digital representation of, by, and for a natural person over which he has principal authority and through which he intentionally communicates or acts. So there's a lot loaded into that definition. And that was the bulk of the work that we did in the off season. And Mr. Greenwood, who's present here, can go into the thought behind each of the words and phrasing after I take off in a few minutes. Organizational digital identity is parallel language, but we recognize that as a minimum, as we move forward, we're going to want things like businesses and organizational entities to have legal standing. And we're going to want to imbue those with separate rights from what a person is going to have a natural person. So we just set up the construct from the beginning, organizational, individual as that delineation. And then theoretically in the future, we'll empower them accordingly uh, with privacy and property rights. And you'll hear in public testimony, some of the thoughts behind how we're looking to do that. So we put that into title eight. And now again, traveling backwards a little bit to page two or bottom of page one onto page two. Now we're creating chapter 30 of title 40, the Digital Identity Act, which begins with definitions. And these definitions are simply references to those general definitions that we put in title eight. And then the only other thing this bill really does, as you can see on page two onto page three, is clone the language for the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act which is already in Wyoming statute from a few years ago uh, to empower your digital identity and your organizational digital identity with parallel power and authority to what you have with your electronic signature through UEDA. So again, not a magnificent step, but sort of the first step to recognize explicitly that your digital identity is representative and authoritative of your actions. And you can see in Romanet one, acts taken through a personal digital identity are attrib attributable to a natural person if they were the act of the natural person. The act of the natural person may be established in any manner, including a showing of the, the efficacy of any security procedure applied to determine the natural person to which an electronic record or electronic signature or other act was attributable. Parallel language in Romanet two for the organizational, and then Romanet three, again, as you read a language, getting to the intent and context of the circumstances surrounding the creation or execution of the event. And at this point, Mr. Chairman, that's what the bill does, but it's a foundation that I want everyone to contemplate what we're looking to in a broader picture where we want you to be able to act through this authoritatively as we get into a blockchain realm. That's going to be typically through public and private key exchanges, where if you have, for example, a business registered through the state of Wyoming that has an organizational digital identity and a public key present, uh, that can be used for transactions with any company around the world authoritatively. You as an individual, if you opt to have a digital representation of yourself through your digital identity you can have a public key and you know your private key and you can authoritatively engage in transactions. You can screen information at your desire. Uh, there's a great use case that we kind of contemplate as we began this discussion. When you go in and you're, you're buying a six pack of some delicious IPA uh, and you walk up and you want to prove your age, to the person at the cash register, what do you do? You take out your driver's license. You hand that to them. They know where you live, what your name is, whether you're an organ donor, all sorts of things that you don't necessarily want them to know because what you want them to know is a simple binary question. Are you 21? Yes or no. Digital identity concepts are trying to empower the ability to select what information you share with whom, when, and there are a number of commercial products out there, uh, frameworks, organizations that are moving towards this. 
we're trying to be entirely technology neutral and build a legal construct that enables all of these technologies to start in Wyoming and take hold here. There's a lot of enthusiasm in that industry and space, uh, but this doesn't pick any of those technologies. It doesn't say you have to have a digital identity. It just creates that baseline framework, Mr. Chairman, that we wanted to make sure was there so that industry can come and work with us. And I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman, see if there's any questions, but then get to Representative Lindholm and Mr. Greenwood. And I will be leaving in about three minutes. Mr. Chairman. And Senator, just I like to take the example you gave and uh, and uh, add to it a little bit, because the example I like is my daughter. Who's purchasing a rated R movie at the supermarket and it requires her identification and the checker at the stand is a registered sex offender. And when she provides her, I, when my daughter provides her ID to that gentleman, he, uh, he, he knows her address. And uh, when that's un, a completely unnecessary to your point that we reach a place where we can answer and prove only the, as you call it, the binary question, are, are you of the age necessary? All the, all the other information doesn't matter. Um, question, Senator, what did you do to this bill to turn it blue? Mr. Chairman, we had a number of meetings among the working group members after we first drafted the bill that came to the Senate. Uh, but the only thing that's changed is on page four, when you look at the definitions, uh, On lines three and then mirrored below on 12, the original definition we had was over which he has dominion and through which he intentionally communicates or acts. Uh, we were kind of uncomfortable with the word dominion and we spent some trying to, trying to come up with a better term for what we were looking for. Sovereignty is the word we wanna use. But sovereignty has so much baggage. Right. So we couldn't use that, but it's like the perfect word with tremendous baggage elsewhere in statute. So we punted on it. We came up with principal authority, which didn't seem to contradict or overlap any other concepts. Got the point across. Principal authority means that you're the initiator of the authority. Effectively, you've got that primary uh, intrinsic authority. And so we decided that was a better two word phrase to capture what we're looking for than dominion. And that's the only change, twice. Sometimes these meetings are a blur to me, but I feel like I may have spent eight hours discussing sovereignty yes. in this bill to only that, see it not in the bill. That may be accurate. Yeah. <clears throat> and Mr. Chairman, my apologies, but I have to run to another meeting. You're in good hands with some incredible people that we have here and all right. uh, look forward to chatting with you about this later. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Time. Mr. Lindholm. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you. Yeah, likewise, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, committee members. Uh, this piece of legislation comes from, I know it seems like a really super simple bill. And, and realistically, what we, what you're looking at really is a, a, a simplified version. But the reality behind this piece of legislation is it comes from a monster amount of uh, work trying to figure out this digital identity piece. Um, and, and, and the reason, Mr. Chairman, on, on why I say there's so much work put in and yet this is fairly simple is because this is this is a big dog. This is a monster. This could be um, one of those next big things for the state of Wyoming. And I'm not talking about uh, buying a buying a, a couple cans of booze or or uh, a rated R movie or something like that. I, I take a very different stance on this and why I think it could be a, a bigger deal. And it has to do with um, online accounts. And it has to do with when you're signing up for a bank account or something like that. The federal government mandates that you do uh, something called BSA standards, which stands for the Banking Secrecy Act. That was first passed in, I think it was 71, 1971, Mr. Chairman, and it was amended in the 2001 Patriot Act. Um, all of which came well before where we are currently in technology with online banking and these digital asset exchanges and these community banks even having a, um, the ability to provide that, uh, that opportunity for you to cash checks online. And 
so we're faced with kind of some old world regulation and how does the state of Wyoming adapt to that um, to allow allow this to happen? Because currently right now, if you open up an online account, I don't, I, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if any of your members of your committee or yourself have ever opened on an online account for a banking type institution. Uh, but we've got all these kind of every every outfit out there has their different kind of rules set up in place on how they verify your identity. Um, Mr. Chairman, they've got to do what's called know your customer anti money laundering standards. So they've got to complete that that process. And how do you do that online? Well, different outfits do it in different ways. One outfit will have you hold up your driver's license in front of your face with a newspaper from the from the day you're taking the uh, the picture. Uh, proving that it is actually you, and uh, then you've got to scan your identity, and, and all of, all of these different aspects, trying to conform 2001 technology into 1970s and 2001 technology. 2001 doesn't seem that long ago, but folks, I joined the U.S. military in 2001, and that was 20 years ago. So <laughs> it, it it has been a little while, and so. For me, that's why I'm excited about this legislation. Uh, you'll notice um, it, it does go into Title 40. The, the new language does right there on page uh, page one goes into Title 40. And that's your trade and commerce uh, statute. That's your trade and commerce title. And then it creates a new chapter. Um, and that's Chapter 30, Digital Identity Act. And so, Mr. Chairman, that's creating essentially a placeholder for hopefully one day we can figure out that loophole in KYC standards. Um, where we can allow these these little community banks, uh, like uh, my community bank, Sunat State Bank, and these other institutions that exist in the state of Wyoming to be able to grow outside of their little communities and maybe do online banking in a way that no other jurisdiction can. And that's what this is about, is allowing our our little community banks, our little little businesses in the state of Wyoming to grow outside of our border and expand their businesses and new businesses to come in. And I think that's really where the merit of this uh, of this legislation stands is, as uh, as Senator Rothfuss said, or Chairman Rothfuss of uh, the Select Blockchain Committee, um, it does create that foundation, which I think is important. Um, we could not figure out how to, uh, pardon my language, Mr. Chairman, how to bastardize the Banking Secrecy Act. Um, and that's still a work in progress. I do know that there is some interest um, from some U.S. senators in the regards to fixing the Banking Secrecy Act um, to allow the state of Wyoming more flexibility in this regard. And, uh, but I'm not speaking on behalf of that individual. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. So with that, I'll stand for any questions, Mr. Chairman. Representative Yim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lindholm, I'm just curious where you are testifying from because you did not announce that at the beginning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Room, I think. Mr. Chairman, Home, where are you testifying from? I'm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm testifying from my kitchen table, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I'm usually in my basement. But I've got too many political signs down there, so uh, I figured I better move my laptop upstairs away from said political signs. So, Mr. Lindholm, when I want to open a bank account, I just text my banker and say I need to open an account, or I want to. I want to get this loan or whatever it is. I just text him. So what, how does, how does that world change for me in Wyoming or does it really, or are we really talking about bringing in um, some, I, I guess some growth, some outside Wyoming it's, it's outside the world that's banking. Is that what you're talking about? Mr. Chairman, I'm talking about both things. So when you text your banker, that's an existing relationship that you already have. And that banker has already established, know your customer and anti-money laundering standards on you. And they've got proof of that. They can share those that, that proof of concept in, in inside house. They can't share that with another institution. Mr. Chairman, if you were to contact another banking institution that you didn't already have an existing relationship with, you would have to you would have to prove uh, prove that know your customer and anti money laundering standards all over again. Fortunately, most of us in the state of Wyoming, I I suspect uh, all of us, in fact, have had a bank account for quite some time, and so it's really not that kind of a wild concept until you go to online, <laughs> until you open up a new a new account online, and then all of a sudden it's 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 pretty burdensome in that regard. Um, but this this putting in the, this in statute so that provides that opportunity where hopefully something um, would shake 
shake loose as far as our regulatory entities, the division of banking in the state of Wyoming, those types of entities where they would be able to utilize this type of legislation possibly. Um, but also, Mr. Chairman, I think this, this is uh, just like a lot of the piece of legislation that we've passed in regards to ICOs and all those things, this puts a flag in the ground and does something in the state of Wyoming that no other jurisdiction has even contemplated and prov provides um, the most important thing. Um, and I know the, the, the legal minds on your committee, uh, such as uh, Representative Oakley and yourself, and I'm sure I'm missing some attorneys that I probably don't know. Um, Representative Crago, but he's not. He's not Rep here right now. Representative Crago is one of my uh, one of my one of my favorite new legislators. And then uh, Representative Yin, we give him an honorary Juris Doctorate. Well, that's handy, Mr. Chairman. I don't know why I didn't get one of those. Um, but I, but I think that legal precedence aspect, Mr. Chairman, is is so important, and that that's why Wyoming has seen success. That's why IOHK is domiciled in the state of Wyoming. That's why Kraken's moving here, and the list goes on on these large institutions because legal precedence means the world to larger institutions. And so, yeah, I guess that's a long way of answering your question, Mr. Chairman. I thought I saw a hand to my left. You're just eating chips. Maybe that's what. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> I I had the barbecue ones earlier. I'm good. Questions for Mr. Lindholm. Oh, it was you, Vice Chairman Washit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Former Representative Lindholm, good to see you again. <clears throat> As we were talking and listening to the good senator present the bill, and he, he was talking about this being foundational to eventually establishing uh, property rights and privacy rights associated with this digital identity. Uh, the first thought that popped into my mind is, are there any responsibilities to go along with those rights? Will these types of digital identity also carry with them some social or civil responsibilities? Mr. Lindholm? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and, and to Mr. Vice Chairman, um, great to see you, sir. Um, I, you know, honestly, when it comes to digital identity or this, this type of legislation, this, this law doesn't exempt anybody from um, identity theft or any other type of criminal statutes um, that are in existence. Um, but there is a right and responsibility throughout the, throughout the legislation as defined. Um, specifically, Mr. Chairman, um, under on page three, under Roman net number three, I think an important part of this piece of legislation um, is starting on line 10, and that, that is shall be determined from the context and surrounding circumstances at the time of its creation, execution, or adoption. So, M Mr. Chairman, and, and to you, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, to me, um, that essentially means that uh, that that proof of digital identity for the execution of whatever type of transaction, because this is only for transactional type aspects in that regard, that would mean it's only for that one execution um, per time that you actually utilize that digital identity. So it's not a it's not it's, it's definitely not written as a carte blanche. Any other questions for Mr. Lindholm? All right, got off pretty easy, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I was at, I was expecting you to mess with me a little bit, so I'm glad to get out with my my hide still attached. I have, uh, unfortunately, so many questions about this bill that I I just uh, I might have to follow up with the email on them to you. All right. Mr. Greenwood. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to, to be here. Uh, my name is Dazza Greenwood. I run law.mit.edu. That is a, um, an initiative at MIT that is focused on applying engineering to law. Um, and uh, we call it computational law in particular. And um, I run civics.com, uh, which is my um, my private company. And uh, in in all of my endeavors since since the 90s, when I was a, a government lawyer, um, the same issue has been coming up, which is the need to well, solve, if you will, for for digital identity. It's been really a missing piece. Um, and 
and and and it all starts, I think, with the, with getting the right legal framework in place. But but we can still see today, um, when we think of digital identity, uh, um, Representative Lindholm uh, mentioned accounts, and this really being about like an account that we use. Uh, the accounts that we have from Google, uh, from our employers, our, our patient portals government IDs, social media, of course, uh, they're all the, these fractions of our identity. And the, the one thing that they all have in common is that they're issued by somebody else. They're, in a sense, owned and controlled primarily by some other entity. They can set the terms, turn them on or off, change them. Um, it's like a privilege, in a sense, um, at best. And, and yet, I think it's just plainly obvious now in 2021, the world is going digital. Um, you know, all the activities we do in commerce and in and with government and, and in healthcare and education, every every part of our life and the economy and society increasingly is happening, like the authoritative activities happening online. But where is the space for our identity? Um, the, the one that arises from us. Um, <clears throat> that's almost implied in most legal frameworks um, that preceded the digital age. Um, <clears throat> and we did a very careful um, analysis of Wyoming statutes and the constitution and the, the rules leading up from uh, being a territory to a state, many places where individuals were identified. Uh, and there was a lot implied in, in the individual uh, and in the person and in the citizen and the resident, um, they're the ones that needed to consent to be governed. They're the ones that, um, that from whom authority arose uh, for them to conduct their affairs. Um, they they were the, uh, well, to, to use the word we used to use, they had dominion in a sense over their identity. Um, and that was a building block and, and, and it made perfect sense. That's all been confused somewhat based on the way architectures have evolved online. And so there's and some of this is just having legally we, we there's something missing that that is now solved in this legislation, which is the first building block, which is itself a definition, just a there there describing a, a, a person's individual identity, um, the one that is of by and for them through which um, they have principal authority. Principal P A L, um, like in, in um, agency law, the, the, the authority arises from them, um, and and uh, and you know after much drafting and back and forth and many cycles of of feedback um, from broader communities, uh, including at MIT, um, where we've circulated this in uh, classes and in talks and, and sought to get a lot of feedback on this. And uh, and in other circles as well, trade associations, we think we've got it. And, and part of the reason I, I'm so such a fan of this definition is precisely because it is so simple. Right? We, we really couldn't have made it more rudimentary. And it's of the same size as the as the as the other definitions in in um, in, um, in in the chapter with the definitions that apply um, across Wyoming law. You know, they're all like, you know, 10 to 30 words. And, and we think that's the right, that was, that's what we were shooting for. And we, we, I think we felt that if, if we couldn't explain this in that few words, we, we pro it probably wasn't ready for a definition that would serve the role as being, to be a building block that could be referenced by and ultimately supported and reflected in, in other parts of Wyoming law. The, the first other part, as has been said many times, is, is, uh, Uniform Electronic Transactions Act and the rules of attribution of acts to people online. And that that, is, that does get us toward the accountability or the responsibility that was being asked about a moment ago. So one is um, responsible for, for the acts that they take through their digital identity. Um, and I think looking ahead, uh, if, if this definition is acceptable and, and is adopted and uh, enacted, in future sessions, um, some other areas of law that seem like they may be good fits may be identity theft and, and possibly section um, 63902, uh, the unlawful impersonation through electronic means. 
you know, we, we think the identity that is a person's identity um, should not be subject to, uh, you know, a fraudulent or criminal impersonation. Uh, so like that would be a, a perfect extrapolation of this. You can imagine privacy, but also civic, civic uh, and commercial um, uh, uh, legal frameworks also uh, benefiting from this so that we can start to, in, in, a, in a reasoned way, um, adopt a sense of individual identity uh, you know, through the law. And so uh, with that, I want to, um, I think, pause my remarks and just say that I am very much in favor of, of this legislative definition and of this measure. And, and, and I, I hope the committee, if, if you believe it is of value and timely as well, will seek to adopt it. Mr. Greenwood, how many states statutorily define uh, personal or digital identity? So I, I think that this formulation might be the first of its kind. Um, there are many examples of digital identity in different ways being defined in statute. Uh, in, I, I mentioned identity theft, for example, and personally identifiable information and breach notification. And digital identity, if you do just like a, a Westlaw or Lexus search or something comes up all over the place. That's partly why we added a word here to get to which facet of identity are we talking about? Not the identity that is coming from others, which, you, which people certainly have rights and interests in and can cause them harm and, and benefit, but we added personal digital identity um, to distinguish this uh, and limit it to the building block, which which um, which is the one that sources from the person, or sometimes colloquially people say self-sovereign or self-sourced identity. Um, and so this is something that's been talked about a lot in um, digital identity circles. Uh, it was the center of something called NSTIC, National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which was a um, uh, a public-private partnership um, that NIST and um, GSA and Homeland Security ran with a bunch of industry groups where they were attempting to come up with private sector-led standards for this type of identity that comes from people and that can be relied upon by um, by others. Uh, and so th there's been a, a push towards something like this, but this is the, the first um, of its type to be articulated in, in a clear and I think very valid manner in statute. And Honestly, we, the people who have been barking up this tree, we've always felt that statute was the right place to at least define the terms and allow others to build, build toward those terms. And, and so we, we hope that you will be the first to adopt this. And part of the conversation the committee uh, did involve the um, hope and maybe expectation that um, this definition might just have legs and we might in fact see this adopted in other jurisdictions uh, to follow because it does fill a very well known need. Is the same true for organizational digital identity? Yes. It, it, well, I, I'd have to do some more checking there. The most important area that is reflected in, in various layers of law, I'd say is the legal entity identifier LEI, uh, which is more from banking and finance and like FinCEN, uh, financial crimes enforcement kind of angle. Uh, and it's basically they're seeking to have a unique identifier for each legal entity, as opposed to the tangled web we have of so many identifiers right now. And that makes it difficult for, you know, commerce and uh, regulation and enforcement, investing and analysis and all sorts of stuff. Um, but that's not but that's an identifier that's going to come from a registry if it if it matures at all. There, there isn't an actual legal definition of the entity and just to uh, of the digital yeah, a definition of the, the digital legal identity of the company. And just to put it just to put that in context for a moment, uh, just a couple of days ago, I was working with uh, with a startup who is seeking to build apps and services for companies to um, take information from and connect information to their Google business identity. 
Um, and so when you look at Google Maps, you'll see lots of companies and you'll see them on the map and you can click on them and you can see their store hours, their contact, their website. They're filling a gap here that I would think in the first instance is, is that of state government in the United States to, to fulfill. The, the government, the state government is, is, through the secretary of state gives rise to or, or is the authoritative source of when a business is born by incorporation or LLC formation. And, and there, you can't go to a registry, but th again, there's no there there. And so we have companies like Google and of course, Dun & Bradstreet and many others that are filling the gap digitally, but they can only go so far. At some point at the bottom of the stack, we need an authoritative identity and a profile that, that, that entities can act through. And it, it'll just end by saying, if you think of things like phishing attacks, when people get an email purportedly from their bank or from some company and they start to do things, um, how can they know whether this is the company it purports to be? Again, the, the ambiguity here and the, that's being exploited or just causing confusion comes partly because we don't have an authoritative organizational digital identity. And having a legal definition, we think, is a real good start. And ultimately, things like the APIs and other reforms happening in Wyoming Secretary of State's uh, area um, can adopt that and can extend uh, can extend that into other areas of law and practice. Questions for Mr. Greenwood. Mr. Greenwood, the moment I realized I existed is when I had a Wikipedia page. I was online. That's my digital identity. All right. Thanks, Mr. Greenwood. Appreciate you. We'll see you more of this. I'm sure we'll see you this uh, interim. Thank you.